first of all, thanks to everyone for coming today. Um, this is an overview of annual operations plans on state forests for fiscal year 23. I'm Jason Cox with the Oregon Department of Forestry's Public Affairs Program. And over the course of this presentation, you're going to learn about the state forest planning process, get a high level look at proposed operations and forest projects, plan for fiscal year 23. And uh, we're also here to answer any questions you may have. We'll have a public comment process starting this Monday, and later we'll go over how you can participate in that process. Uh, next slide, please. So um, again, thank you for joining us. I know um, most of you at this point are very familiar with the virtual meeting format um, through Zoom, but I'm gonna offer up a few tips to help us get the most out of this. Um, as you're joining, it's helpful to know who's here. It looks like pretty much everyone has renamed yourselves already in the platform. Uh, but if you haven't, go ahead and give us your first and last name along with your affiliation if you have one. Um, for logistics, you should be able to see the PowerPoint up on the screen if you're watching the Zoom platform. If you have a question or comment, please use the raise hand button to get in the queue to speak. And if you haven't used that before, it's under reactions now on the toolbar. So there's an extra click there to get to that. Um, periodically, we, um, we can pause and ask, uh, we'll call on folks who have their hands up. If you're in the meeting by phone only, press star nine on your phone and be sure to unmute yourself once you're called on. Um, when you speak, please uh, provide your name and affiliation so we know who you are. And we do ask that um, you use the chat function for troubleshooting rather than uh, making comments or asking questions about the presentation. Reason for that being it just, um, this is being recorded for uh, future viewers and helps get everything out on the table through discussion. So with that, I'm gonna be turning the presentation over to State Forest Planning Specialist, Derek Bangs, who's gonna give you some background on Oregon State Forests and a snapshot of proposed operations for fiscal year 23. Good morning, everyone. As Jason said, uh, my name is Derek Bangs. I work with the Planning Coordination Unit for the Oregon Department of Forestry. So before I get started, I wanted to give some context to Oregon's forest. As you can see by this chart, the majority of Oregon's forests are owned by the federal government. This is primarily a mix of Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. The next largest group is private forests with about 34% split between large private companies and smaller private lands. Tribal forest is the smaller purple wedge at 2%. And today we'll be talking about this little blue wedge here, which is around 4% of the overall land base. Please be aware that this 4% actually includes some other entities that ODF does not manage, like ODOT strips or county managed timberlands. The ODF managed land portion is actually around 3% of the overall forest land base in Oregon. And here's a vicinity map showing the location of Oregon State Forest, just to get everybody orientated on the forest location. The Oregon Department of Forestry provides active integrated forest management of five state forests. These are the Clatsop, Sandy M, and Tillamook State Forests in the Northwest Oregon area, and the Gilcrest and Sun Pass located east of the Cascades. In addition to these state forests, ODF manages scattered forest lands in the vicinity of Philoma, Bonita, Grants Pass, and Coos Bay. By law, state forests are managed to provide social, economic, and environmental benefits to Oregonians. These benefits include healthy and productive forests that provide clean air and water, recreation and outdoor learning opportunities, diverse native fish and wildlife habitat, and a sustainable and predictable flow of timber. State Forest Division manages two types of forest lands. Those lands owned by the Oregon Board of Forestry and the Common School Fund forest lands administered by the State Land Board. Timber from the Board of Forestry lands generate revenue for local governments that supply public services and supports living wage jobs in rural communities. Timber from common school forest lands provide revenue to the common school fund. When timber is harvested on Board of Forestry lands, the revenue is divided between the counties and the state with approximately two thirds of the revenue going to the counties and local taxing districts and the remainder going to the department to fund management of these forest lands. You'll notice on the slide, that these areas are split up into three different FMP areas. This acronym stands for Forest Management Plans. The Northwest Forest Management Plan covers the Astoria, Tillamook, Forest Grove, West Oregon, and San Am districts. It also covers a portion of the Western Lane District. The Southwest Forest Management 
plan covers the other portion of the Western Lane District, and the Eastern Region Forest Management Plan covers the Klamath Lake District, which is primarily the Sun Pass Forest. The next few slides go into some more detail on what these FMPs are and how they provide guidance on the activities located in these areas. ODF manages Oregon State Forests to achieve the greatest permanent value for Oregonians, which produce a range of social, economic, and conservation benefits. To achieve this, ODF uses a tiered planning effort to guide and implement forest management actions. Forest management plans, or FMPs, provide for a high-level management goals and strategies. The Board of Forestry adopts an FMP as Oregon Administrative Rule after making a finding that the FMP achieves an appropriate array of public benefits for Oregonians. Implementation plans, or IPs, are mid-range plans that describe the current condition of the forest and serve to set discrete objectives for specific geographic areas and timeframes to provide for orderly progress towards the FMP goals. Under the current FMP, implementation plans have been developed at the district level for mid-range time periods between FMPs and annual operation plans. AOPs detail the specific management actions for the upcoming fiscal year and describe how these actions fulfill the IP objectives. So the previous slides set the stage for how the forest management plans tear down to the implementation plans, which further tear down to the annual operation plans. What I have on the screen here further emphasizes that relationship. Starting with the forest management plan, these are those long range plans that set forth our guiding principles, goals, and strategies. The implementation plan then builds on that forest management plan by zooming into each district and explaining in more detail how the specific district will meet the goals and strategies laid out in the management plan. In the implementation plan is a description of the kit district's key forest resources, expected timber outputs, recreational opportunities and infrastructure, as well as social, economic, and environmental goals for the implementation plan length. This is where the yearly volume harvest objective is identified, as well as priorities for stream restoration and areas for more biologically diverse stands that benefit wildlife. Lastly, we have the annual operation plans, which is what the primary focus of today's meeting is. These are likely what most of you have seen in the past. AOPs describe the projects each district will pursue in accordance with the implementation plan for a given fiscal year. These may include harvest operations, road work, reforestation, aquatic habitat enhancement, recreation, education, and interpretation projects, et cetera. So as discussed in the previous slide, the FMP has set the overall goals and strategies and the IPs have further refined these by setting specific harvest and habitat targets. The planners and staff utilize this framework to select potential sale and project candidates for the annual operation plans. District staff, planners, and staff specialists work collaboratively to identify and resolve questions and refine the proposed projects. The planners then begin preparing the annual operation plan documents for review. The preliminary AOPs are reviewed by resource specialists from multiple agencies who provide input and feedback specific to their areas of expertise. This includes both internal ODF resource specialists, such as geotechs, aquatic and riparian specialists, biologists, recreation, education, and interpretation, engineers, etc., as well as external specialists, such as ODF and W wildlife and fish biologists and archaeologists. The AOP is also shared with Oregon's nine federally recognized tribes. The draft AOPs then undergo a 45-day public comment period, which generally occurs in the March to May timeframe. Once the public comment period closes, district foresters and staff then review the comments received from the public and consider making any suggested adjustments before approving the plans. The general process that I just outlined is fairly consistent on a year-to-year -year basis. However, there are some higher level planning considerations that arise during the timber sale candidate selection process that tend to be specific to a given year. A key consideration for the fiscal 23 AOP is that the State Forest Division is currently undergoing a large scale policy development process to draft a habitat conservation plan as directed by the Board of Forestry in October of 2020. 
For those of you that may not be aware, a habitat conservation plan, often referred to as an HCP, is a mechanism, mechanism to programmatically comply with the Federal Endangered Species Act. This strategy is different than the take avoidance strategy that we currently use. As the division plans for the potential transition to an HCP, the approach to the fiscal 23 AOPs on all districts, except for Climbed Falls, which is outside the draft HCP area, is to meet current implementation plan annual harvest objectives in alignment with the approved forest management plans while considering the goals and strategies of the draft HCP. One of the larger conservation strategies in the draft habitat conservation plan is to designate habitat conservation areas. For this fiscal, we planned our harvest activities with these draft habitat conservation areas in mind. This resulted in no planned modified clear cut harvest within these areas for fiscal 23. There are a few partial cut sales within these areas that were reviewed with our biologists and will be designed to improve wildlife, wildlife habitat consistent with the long-term goals of the habitat conservation areas. So before I shift off into the next one, I just wanted to pause for a second to see if anybody had any questions um, on what I have done up to here uh, that set the stage for how we get into the, the annual operation plan. Seeing no raised hands. All right, now that we have set the stage for how the annual operation plan process works, I'll pivot the focus a bit to look at what is inside our annual plans and some examples of how these forest operations and projects provide for a suite of economic and environmental benefits. To start with, the next few slides focus on a handful of the social benefits provided by our annual plans. I'm gonna start things off with recreation. Recreation opportunities on state forest land connect people to state forests, the Oregon Department of Forestry, and working forests in ways that help develop understanding and support for the work we do. Visitors are primarily coming from local and regional communities, but we're seeing increases in visitation from neighboring states and more frequent use from international visitors. Some aspects of our program, like OHV Trail Systems and the Tillamook Forest Center, consistently draw visitors from around the country. In our developed campgrounds, we're generally hosting over 40,000 visitors a year. State forests are also a popular destination for recreation opportunities since many lands are near population centers. For example, the Tillamook State Forest is an hour drive away from downtown Portland. Recreation use on state forests can be at a formal facility such as the designated campgrounds or trails, or as this photo shows on the Wilson River. Recreation use can also be dispersed and informal. State forests pro provide a unique niche of a relatively rustic camping setting. For the fiscal 23 year, many of our recreation projects are located on the Sandy Am State Forest, where we're repairing some of the damage that occurred during the Labor Day fires. Other projects include maintenance of existing facilities and some long range planning opportunities that we are looking at in several districts. One of our key education and interpretation tools is the Tillamook Forest Center. Unfortunately, due to COVID, our Tillamook Forest Center has been closed since March of 2020. The numbers shown here are the averages that we saw pre-COVID. We're currently focused on rebuilding our team at the Tillamook Forest Center and are excited to open the doors as soon as we have onboarded and trained our new staff. One of the interesting things about the suite of public benefits derived on state forests to achieve the greatest permanent value is that oftentimes many of the benefits of either social, economic, or environmental do not just fall into one of the boxes. One great example of this is the county revenue and jobs. In fiscal 21, the Oregon Department of Forestry distributed approximately $71.5 million to the counties. This revenue was primarily provided to rural communities where it represents a significant portion of the county general funds from which essential services are provided. Additionally, the jobs provided tend to be medium to high wage family jobs, significantly over the average for the majority of the counties in which these jobs are located. With that last slide as a lead in, I'll get started on some of the economic benefits. So on the screen here, I'm showing the planned activities for the fiscal 23 year. 
As discussed prior, the planned average volume per year is set in the implementation plan, and each year the AOPs are adjusted to try to land as close to that average as possible. This is a running tally, so if the previous year was high or low, the following year will be adjusted to compensate. Please note that I've broken these, title, these totals up a bit. The Eastern Oregon Area Management Plan sets an acreage target instead of a volume target, and it, it was throwing the totals off a bit, so I pulled that out separate to show their numbers. Please also note that the sales in the Gilcrest are listed as chip sales. These are primarily fuel mitigation sales. However, opportunities to market saw logs will be explored where possible. For fiscal year 23, the projected revenue from timber sales is just over $90 million. Revenue from our timber sales is split into several buckets. For the case of common school lands, any sales that fall into this ownership has the net revenue generated on these go directly to the common school fund. For this fiscal, we're looking at just over 2.2 million headed in this direction. For the Board of Forestry Lands, 63.75% of net timber sale dollars go to the counties, local schools, and taxing districts where the harvest occurs. On the screen here, I've listed a handful of the uses that this money goes to. Just over 56 million is predicted to head towards counties during this fiscal year. These monies go to pay for education, health and public safety, fire districts, recreation, transportation, and soil and water con conservation. And this is just the name of a few of the services that are paid directly from these dollars. The remaining 36.25% of monies generated from Board of Forestry Lands stays with the department to help fund the costs of providing the full range of services that create the greatest permanent value. These costs include all timber management activities, such as reforestation, road maintenance, surveys for threatened endangered species, costs of fire protection, recreation, education, and interpretation, and stream improvement opportunities. ODF is primarily all self-funded. One exception is that we do receive some dollars from the Oregon Department of Parks and Recreation that come from sticker fees on OHV vehicles. These funds are then put directly into our OHV program to help off offset some of the costs of this program. The rest of the costs are picked up by the revenue share mentioned previously. And now we'll be shifting over to some of the environmental benefits. There are many aspects of what we do that contribute to environmental benefits. Today, I'm gonna to focus on some of the building blocks. To start off with, I'll discuss legacy structural components. So legacy structural components is mentioned throughout the FMP, IPs, and AOPs. It can be difficult to understand without some context. Listed on the screen here are just a few examples of this in order to help flesh this out. First on this list is remnant tree protection. Existing old growth trees are generally scattered individual trees or occasionally clumped in small isolated patches. These trees are reserved from harvest. When they are identified, they are posted out or protected. In addition to that, the Northwest and Southwest management plans require that when performing any regeneration harvest, that we retain an average of five green trees per acre. We strive to put these trees in different arrangements wherever possible. Sometimes these trees will be scattered across the landscape, sometimes left in clumps, focused on unique features in stream buffers, and often it's a combination of all these things. As much as possible, the goal is to strive for variety as different species benefit from different arrangements. All perennial and many seasonal streams are buffered depending on if fish are present, size of the stream, and the steepness of the terrain. These buffers can be found both on the lower slopes of harvest operations and can extend well into the uplands. In addition to stream buffers, areas of inner gorges, wetlands, and other unique features are also buffered, contributing to the overall mix of legacy structures. Snags are saved wherever possible during harvest. The deciding factor on this is generally safety related. To mitigate this safety concern, oftentimes some of those wildlife trees previously mentioned, will be posted in a clump around snags in order to retain it without putting workers at risk. Existing downwood is retained and additional downwood is created within the units post-harvest in order to provide habitat needs of wildlife species as well as provide other key ecosystem functions. This requirement can be obtained in a number of ways and is often a result of the sale administrators working closely with contractors to identify the best logs or tops to be left to fulfill this need. As stated earlier, this is by no way 
a comprehensive list, but instead just a handful of examples of the many ways the structural components are left on the landscape. One other item to note is that due to the difference in forest types, the Eastern Region Plan is written on more of an uneven age management style. What this means is that these stands are in a perpetual state of thinning with some patch cuts or salvage oper operations intermixed. This causes many of those structural components to be incorporated at different levels in these stands than the Northwest or Southwest Management Plan areas. So you've been hit with a lot of numbers today and I'm gonna hit you with some more. Uh, this topic is one that I'm pretty proud of. All the data up here was pulled directly from OWEB. OWEB stands for Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. Each year, as we complete projects across our ownership, we, we report that data to OWEB and they keep a running tally of all of our projects as well as projects completed by other landowners. The pictures here on the right represent habitat enhancement. This is where we're bringing logs into the area to try to create pools or cover for fish. This allows fish that are coming upriver places to stop and rest, as well as providing spawning habitat and safety from predators. Fish passage improvements are where we have identified that there is a blockage of some kind, keeping fish from moving up a stream system. Some examples are culverts that aren't big enough or have an outfall that make it difficult for fish to swim through or old railroad punch-ins where logs and debris were used to allow for equipment to walk across the stream. The picture shown in the bottom left is a fish pipe that was installed on state forest land. Today, when we do these improvement projects, it opens up streams that are now available for spawning habitat. This is what the miles of access represents. Every year, we screen all of our sales for adjacent fish streams and schedule field visits as necessary with our staff stream specialists to identify areas that would most benefit from enhancement activities. This year, 20 sales were identified that have potential for an enhancement project. As sale layout begins on these sales, our staff stream specialists will work with the district to potentially narrow down the list and develop potential projects. We have a robust threatened endangered species surveying program. All sales and projects are reviewed to determine if they have potential habitat for marble murrelet or spotted owls. Prior to the operation commencing, all surveys are completed to ensure that there are no endangered species present in these stands. On the screen here, I've presented some of the numbers from the last fiscal year, where we surveyed just over 1,200 sites for marble murrelet and just under 34,000 stations for spotted owls. The approximate price tag for these surveys was just under $2 million. We anticipate that the survey needs will be similar during this fiscal year, and in addition to these two species, we will be surveying for goshawks in the Eastern Management Plan region. All of the regeneration unit harvests are replanted post-harvest. One major focus over this last year has been some of the reforestation efforts on the San Diego State Forest post Labor Day fires. After the fire burned through these areas, we had large swaths of ground that were severely burned where the trees were dead and dying. Some of these acres are counted in the seedling number that's shown here. In addition to those planted seedlings, there was an extensive aerial seeding program where we focused on areas that had poor access or where there was an increased danger due to the number of snags in the area that were not economically feasible to remove. So the public comment period for the annual operations plans will be March 21st to May 5th. I've listed the website here, which for those of you listening in is tiny, T-I-N-Y dot C-C backslash Oregon State Forest. Going to that website, will allow you to access the AOPs themselves, as well as a web map tool where you can zoom into the area of interest to you and get more information on a planned operation. Please be aware that these will not be live until the March 21st timeframe, so I'm giving you the info here a few days early. ODF staff reviews all comments. For context, this comment period is specific to the fiscal year 23 planned operations. Separately, we are revising our forest management plan as part of the earlier mentioned habitat conservation planning process and broader proposals and statements on forest policy are a better fit for that process. The most useful comments 
speak to how the annual operation plan is or is not consistent with the current implementation plan and the forest management plan that focus on improving efficiency or effectiveness that are correcting an error, adding information or clarifying matters and are solutions oriented with the understanding that state forests by law must meet social, environmental and economic goals and offering how the department should best meet those goals. And with that, does anybody have any questions? So let's see questions. Um, I saw Greg first and then Sue. So um, Greg. Yes, I have, a, I have two questions. One um, mentioned early in the presentation that you uh, manage uh, about young stand management. Uh, I didn't hear any mention about managing old stand management. Um, that was my first question. The second question, more specific regarding, uh, say, the Classic County Forest. Um, I jotted down there was, um, what was that figure for uh, their management there? I was wondering how much uh, within the Classic County Forest is set aside for older trees, old growth management, what percentage might be kind of off limits to clear cuts? That's a very specific question. I'm, I'm with the uh, forest team of the Oregon Chapter Sierra Club. Thank you. Um, but, Derek or Ron want to try to take that? I think I think I can take a stab at it, and then if um, if I miss anything, Ron can fill in. And so to start with on on the um, there was a couple questions there, and so if if I, if I miss one, feel free to um, chime in. So first on the the older growth trees, uh, it, it's in our management plan and in our implementation plan. That we don't cut old growth where those are identified; they're reserved. Um, and we also have uh, only 30% of the that's put into a, um, a landscape design that's, that's, uh, that we set aside for, for more complex forests. And um, so it's for the Astoria district specifically that you asked for, it's about 30% of, of the land base. And Ron, did I miss anything there? No, no, you got it. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Sue, you're next. Thank you. Um, when you talk about snags, are you thinking in terms of the next 50 or 60 years to leave lots of snags so lots of animals and birds can use them? So so for the snags, it's, it's two things. Where whenever they're in the the clear cut units, we're trying to leave them wherever possible um, and so it's as many as we can leave. There are some safety concerns with snags as operators are working around them, especially snags that are, that are not sound. Um, and so what we mean by that is if there's a danger of them falling on top of someone, oftentimes those are removed for, for, for safety reasons. But yes, the intent of leaving those is so that, uh, you know, a various species are, are able to use those snags, everything from birds to, to owls um, for the next, you know, however, however long. Okay. And I noticed you are putting in a lot of the, the logs into the rivers, et cetera. Um, what are you doing about the beavers? Can, can beaver, they're not poachers, beaver, um, you know, they're allowed to come in and trap beavers. Is that true in your area? Or can they leave beavers to do the job that you're doing? <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, this last year, we, we've been working with uh, a few, few separate groups, do some beaver analog studies where we're, we're actually trying to get beaver to move into areas. Um, and so far, it, the, you know, the initial results have been pretty successful of that. Um, Good. Um, so what do you do with the people who can come in and trap them? Do you keep them from trapping? I guess I'm not sure on this one, Ron, do you have yeah, an answer? Yeah, that? so that's, you know, anybody who's a fur trapper who can do that legally in the state of Oregon, that's regulated through the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And if they're permitted to do that and, and appropriately um, 
you know, licensed through ODF and W, that's a permissible activity on state forest lands. So you can put them in and they can come and take them out. <laughs> we you don't guys regulate need to that. work together. <laughs> yeah, we don't regulate that within the forestry department, though. I know you don't regulate it, but somebody needs to be working together so this works because those beavers can do an incredible job and it's a lot less expensive than what you do. Okay, just just a point to make there. Um, and are, how many different varieties of trees are you replanting and how does it look with um, climate change? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and take a shot at, at that unless John Walter is happens to be on. I don't know if he's on or not. I don't think John's here, but we're, we're planting a variety of, of tree species. So we're planting, you know, probably, and Robbie Lefebvre is, is here too. Robbie, would you like to field that one? I see you just turned your camera on. Yeah, I can take that, Ron. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we do plant a variety. You know, we plant Douglas fir, Western hemlock, grand fir, noble fir, Western red cedar, uh, and red alder, as well as ponderosa pine. Um, so we're planting them, you know, across our state forest, across this AOP. And we are doing uh, research to look at kind of that assisted migration, as well as uh, doing some other things to make sure that we have seedlings that will be ready for future climates. Um, and so we have a seed orchard that we collect all of our seed from, and that is something that we are really cognizant about to make sure that the trees we put in today survive the current climate that it's in, as well as when, you know, 50, 60, 70 years down the road. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Hey, hey, Jason, um, can I, do you mind if I jump in? Uh, go for it, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brett Brownscombe with Wild Salmon Center, and uh, thanks, Derek and, and Ron. Um, but Derek, thanks for the overview. And it was good to hear the part about how the um, <clears throat> this year's AOPs are going to be are working to kind of try to synchronize with a proposed HCP that isn't yet in hand and still fluid. Um, so I know ODF's kind of in, a, in that limbo space, but um, it was good to hear that it sounds like for the proposed HCAs, it's partial thins or partials, partials only and no modified clear cuts in there. And um, thanks, I mean, that helps. I think it's just a hot button issue and um, it's helpful. On the overall, um, can you give a little more sense of, so from a previous year's AOP or previous prior, whatever prior year's AOPs, if um, if the IP targets have been exceeded or or um, undermet, and it's looking like the 10 year period of the IP is rolling forward, can you explain a bit more about how the balance is either, the, either the balance or the deficit is carried forward or made up in the, in this one relative to what, where we are from the past? Sure. So, so that's a running tally. Um, so, you know, if, uh, so I'll, I'll use that story as an example. Uh, I have a 73 million board foot a year tally. And so if the previous year they were 72 million, then next year we're shooting for a 74 million plan so that each year it, we're trying to rectify that as close as possible. Uh, currently, we're within 1% um, on almost all of the, the districts, uh, or less than 1%. And so it's, it's very close. Um, and it's close like that because we're making yearly adjustments to those so that we try to, if we went over or under the goal from the previous year, which is usually um, due to actual cruise values, um, where, where those fluctuations change a little bit um, after we've, we've cruised the timber to sell, uh, we have a little more accurate volume. So we use that value just for the next year to, to hopefully get it rectified the very next year so that we're not carrying something over several years. Cool. Yeah. And, and so on this one, um, it sounds like the projected revenue is around 56 million to counties for FY23. And does that, does that reflect the downward adjustment from where things landed at the end of the last year? Like I, I, what I'm trying to get at is, are there gonna be alternatives taken out of last year's AOP to move in the, into primaries this year to make up for deficit last year? Or are we 
in a surplus and this year is going to be adjusting downward for the surplus. So it, it's pretty close to, to what we had last year. Um, you know, there it's right in that range. Um, as far as the alternates from last year, oftentimes some of the alternates do move forward as the primaries for the next, next year uh, if they were not harvested. Um, the goal is only the, the primaries, the, the ones harvested, uh, hopefully hoping that, uh, you know, the volumes are accurate and then nothing else comes up that causes us to need to move an alternate up. Or, um, and so usually those end up becoming the primaries for the subsequent year. Thanks. Hey, um, next I've got uh, Laura, then Bob. Hi, um, uh, this is Laura Wilson with Hampton Lumber. Um, just a, probably just a quick question for now, but looking forward to digging into the details on Monday when they're released, and then I'll probably be following up with a few of you after that. But on Astoria, it looks like there's a large amount of thinning uh, volume out of the Astoria district. Is that, can someone kind of just speak to that a little bit compared to the other districts? It's pretty large. Yeah, so that gets kind of broken up into a couple different categories. Um, a lot of it is first entry thinning stuff that's in the uh, 30 to 45, well, a little less than 45, 30 to 40 range. Uh, and that's that's just due to the age of the forest that we have. There's a lot of timber that is rolling into that, that category. Um, some of those are a big chunk of those actually are inside of habitat conservation areas. And so that, that mat matched up pretty close with uh, what the goals of those areas were, uh, thinning that denser timber out to promote more growth in, in the understory. And that's that's something that actually for the Astoria district that we've been seeing for the last couple of years, as we've had an age group that has been growing into that uh, that that age range where, where we're looking at those those first entry thinnings. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, thinning is a good, you know, obviously a good practice, forest management practice. You know, the only downside to it is that you're not going to get as high of a, you know, of bid prices on uh, thinning. So you just kind of have to balance those out with the rest of it. So again, I'll see. You'll look at the details on Monday and follow up on some of the stuff. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, next, I've got Bob. Uh, thanks, you guys, for holding this meeting. Um, I uh, I would love to see you guys do a great job of breaking out what the financial benefits are to counties, of which I'm a uh, have residents in Tillamook County, so certainly appreciate that revenue stream as a North Coast resident as well, part time resident. But it would be great to also see what the benefits are to recreation since um, there is a whole industry that revolves around the abundance of fish, wildlife, and clean water on the North Coast. Um, I know back in 2008, there was a, a pretty detailed study by Dean Runyon and Associates that gives a breakout by uh, several different regions in the state of what to the value of fish. Fish, wild, uh, fishing and hunting, uh, shell fishing and wildlife viewing is for each of those districts. Of course, those numbers to be, need to be updated, especially as we're witnessing more and more people utilize state forest land. So I, I think I'd, in these presentations, it'd just be really beneficial to see, you know, what um, this, uh, these contiguous forest habitats provide for, uh, for recreational outputs. And then I'm curious, um, I was uh, elk hunting the other week up in the Miami drainage there. It's hard to get to, but um, got down to the lowlands and saw some of the fruits of your labor there uh, for restoration work. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. So kudos to that. Um, my question is, what is the current um, fish specific restoration efforts that are underway I know historically there's been a pretty deep investment in fish specific recovery uh, restoration projects on the North Coast. ODF had even funded a position out of the Tillamook District for a while. Um, I'm curious to know what current fish restoration commitments are now versus what they've historically been. I know that since you went through about a 30% staff reduction, recreation and restoration, fish restoration projects were kind of on early on that chopping block. So 
I'm, I don't know if there's a plan. I know there's some money in the, through the PFA uh, cords that will uh, fund some restoration positions, probably more on private lands, but given, you know, the fact that we have this deep investment in what state forests produce as far as wild fish production for the sport fishing industry, I'd lo love to know what the current commitment is, you know, based on what I know from the historic commitment being. So thank you. But I can kind of feel that one a little bit. So what, uh, what we usually do for the, for the, especially for the stream, stream related activities is we try to dovetail into the opportunities that are developed with the timber sales. And so those can be a number of different ways. Um, it might be that we have haul routes with uh, fish blockages on them that we're gonna improve as part of the haul route construction. Um, there's also areas where we're logging if we have trees that are available, whether it's cable placement or shovel placement uh, with, with track machinery. Uh, we try to use those, those facility, those, uh, the equipment and the personnel that we have on site with those timber sales uh, because we can get it for significantly cheaper um, when we do it there, since they're already there, they're already moved in. And a lot of times the move-in cost is 50% or more of the overall project costs. And so by us dovetailing into the timber sales with that, we're able to, to do a lot of that work. In this particular fiscal year, as I mentioned earlier, we have about 20 sales that, where we've identified projects um, and those range um, across the districts. And sometimes those are fish fish pipe related and sometimes they're actual uh, wood placement that we're looking at. Um, it just ranges uh, depending on what what we found when we were doing the, the sale review itself. And I see Ron has his hand up, so he might want to further flush out some of my comments. Thanks, Derek, for that. Just wanted to add a little bit more, you know, context there. So we've been very deliberately and intentionally restoring fish habitat on state forest lands for well over 30 years. And obviously when you're pursuing that effort in a deliberate fashion, you're looking at, you know, highest priority restoration efforts, you know, investment versus benefit. So we've really come a long way uh, over multiple decades, assessing our, our land base, working with our, our partners and watershed councils, um, you know, doing assessments on our land. And we've, you know, really uh, improved and removed a lot of the barriers, you know, to fish and improved habitat conditions. We continue to be very mindful of, of that work throughout our holistic management of state forests, you know, and I would just wanted to add, you know, in addition to the investments we've done that were summarized in the kind of OEB reporting, just in a financial, you know, basis there, but we've worked through the majority of our land base on, you know, the real major streams. And now we're down to smaller streams and tributary streams and continue to, to work through those. And we also just from all of our planning incorporate that spirit of intention in our work from harvest unit planning, you know, stream buffers, road locations and design, uh, you know, new drainage structure development and how that's going to function and looking at existing roads for improvements of disconnecting road, you know, drainage from live waters of the state using hard durable rock. So it's a, it's a holistic approach there around water quality. And then, you know, again, decades of really thoughtful work that folks before I've, you know, worked here at the agency and others that are still, you know, pressing forward with that now, you know, all value and, and place as a high priority in our work. So it's very present in our culture. Appreciate those responses. I and yeah, totally see see the fruits of that labor. Understand that you know you guys have worked through a lot of that. Um, I, I I'm not sure I got my question answered in the sense that obviously the commitment is still there. It was certainly an identifiable commitment, especially when the Oregon Plan for Salmon and Watersheds came on board. You guys had specifically funded positions out of the Tillamook District, and maybe uh, Ron, you you answered. The question, we're just running out of restoration projects because we've done a, a large portion of it, but is there is there a need or a commitment to reestablish, um, you know, said positions that have historically existed out of the Tillamook District to continue that work on land, especially given the fact climate change is continually adjusting, uh, you know, lethal water temperatures on, on, on some of these major Tillamook and North Coast tributaries. Sure. So the the intention is certainly still there. As far as positions go, you know, not with uh, not currently an active conversation as in a quote partnership with with ODF and, and W. And I'm 
not sure the need for an actual position you know is there we have an aquatic and riparian specialist and then we're also adding some aquatic and riparian duties to a, a biologist that we're recruiting for here uh, shortly and so so that's a way we're we're approaching that but we do work collaboratively with watershed you know councils and each time we're preparing uh timber sale or other operations and we're going to be somewhere where we're going to have equipment we're assessing those conditions and those streams that are very limited opportunities to be somewhere where you can have access to do something if there's logging equipment in the in the area so we're very carefully screening with our aquatic and riparian specialists all of the planned operations to assess what conditions exist within those operations and then when we have that really unique opportunity to have equipment nearby uh, are there opportunistic things we can do there to make a contribution towards maintenance or recovery? So we are screening all of our operations with our aquatic and riparian specialists to give that deliberate consideration. And then there's more holistic views around like you know, road system management and where there's known priorities and that types of things that we work through you know, systematically as well. But there isn't a, an active conversation about adding a staff to, to just focus on this at that point at this point. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the thorough answers there. We have a having an opportunity to actually harvest a small portion of wild coho this year in ocean and maybe uh, inland fisheries, which is a very unique and rare opportunity. Um, obviously, you know the work that you guys have done on those state forest lands contribute to that opportunity. Um, so, thank you for the good work you've done. I appreciate the thorough answers. Uh, Sue, I see you in the queue there. Um, I wanted to make sure um, before we go back for a second round that um, folks said, had a, anyone had, had other questions, had a chance to do so? All right, well, let's move to back to Sue. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned the roads. Are there plans for new roads because you're going into so many new areas or... Um, how is that working? And that will certainly make some impact. And of course, I'm looking at all of this and your Department of Forestry, your main emphasis, it seems to me, is on taking out trees, <laughs> selling our trees. <laughs> and if you are cutting back on what you call recreation, which I do not, hunting to me is not recreation. Fishing is wonderful, but I don't do that. But I do love to hike and um, there are so many other things that we could use our forest for. And I'm just wondering, are there any plans to look at different ideas of how to run a forest without um, taking out so many trees? Thank you. Well, I can take a stab at the first question on that, which was the, the roads. Um, so there is some road construction that's planned for this fiscal year. And, you know, a well-maintained road systems necessary for working for us and provide both, the, uh, both for the operations as well as recreational access to Oregonians. Um, you know, we, we try to build the minimum amount of roads that we can in order to, to do the operations. Roads are expensive. And so the, the less we can build, the better. But at the same point in time, as has been mentioned a few, few different times, sometimes we need to build roads. Uh, some of the road work that we do is actually to get away from some protected resources, to get away from water. Um, there's a few, there's at least one road that's, that's planned in this fiscal year that's a longer stretch with the intent to vacate some sections of road near waters. And so, yes, we're building some road, um, a longer section of road, with the idea that it will remove some of the of potential conflict in other locations. And that's what we're looking for whenever we do these. As for the, the different ideas um, for the recreation, I don't want to put Laura necessarily on the spot, but Laura, I was wondering if you might be able to um, provide some, some context with some of the work that's been done recently. Yep, thanks, Derek. Uh, Laura Fredrickson, Recreation Education Interpretation Manager, uh, Forest State Forest Division. Um, thanks for the questions that have come up so far about um, recreation in particular. Uh, what I do want to say is just some general remarks. Um, one of our uh, participants already noted um, 
some of the uh, layoffs that happened quite a number of years ago, but um, it does have bearing on where we're at currently. We are now finally uh, staffed up, uh, not to um, full capacity in the sense of uh, before those major layoffs happen. That being said, we went through a major reorganization and are now looking at our state forests across the landscape, whereas before we were looking at them district by district. Um, suffice it to say, it does take a little bit of time to get people into new positions and to really start operating in an integrated fashion um, from one district to another. So much of the past year, um, besides having to deal with the influx of visitors on State Forest, which means many of our staff are public facing and we're really just literally kind of keeping the wheels on the bus and responding to the need out there. Um, but now we are finally positioned to start doing some more um, strategic planning about where do we want to head on state forests comprehensively. Um, we are in the midst of finishing up uh, more of an internal facing uh, planning effort uh, to really ask ourselves, how are we going to make sure that we're doing that integrated look with other divisions of uh, state forests? but additionally then casting some broad goals uh, for ourselves over the next say five to seven years out. Uh, one of our participants, thank you for the question, asked about um, you know, what is the multiplier effect of recreation on state forests? And that is one of our strategic goals that we identified in terms of being able to contract services out um, for a local researcher to do just that. Um, you know, we're good at, um, counting people and counting visitors and capturing some of the um, experientially based information when people come and enjoy state forests, not just around recreational activities, um, but broader than that, interpretive and educational opportunities. That said, we also recognize that there is a multiplier effect. You know, how is the outdoor industry benefiting? Um, how are some of the local guiding services? How are some of the, you know, outdoor gear shops? How are they benefiting as well? Um, suffice it to say, we just simply haven't gotten there yet. Um, it is certainly on our radar. That is one of our strategic goals that we intend to move out on. But um, again, um, it has taken us about a year and a half to really just get ourselves staffed up and really start to um, build in those workflows and business plans of how we're operating across districts. So happy to you know, answer any, any questions there, but I just wanted to give you the broad sense of um, kind of internally what's uh, what has been going on? Do you <clears throat> do you ever think in terms of like, I know that Sierra Club has um, opportunities for members <clears throat> to go different places and work on like work on trails and that kind of thing. Do you ever think of bringing that kind of a, an emphasis in? So we have a very, very committed and active um, user base. We, we, and we are extremely thankful for those um, different user groups, um, very active OHV ATV um, user groups. We also have uh, standing arrangements or agreements, I should say, with Trail Keepers of Oregon. We have multiple um, self-assembling um, user groups. So we, there is no way we could provide the recreational opportunities that we do if we did not have the, the volunteer uh, user groups that we do. Absolutely not. We're just not staffed that way. Uh, we take great pride in the partnerships that we have with our users. Um, and that is one thing that we identified again, kind of in that internal facing phase of our overall planning effort is to really um, firm up those commitments that we have with our user groups and also to extend outward and see if there are other folks who really do value and love and cherish and want to help steward um, recreation, education, interpretation and state forests. So again, that's part of the next phase of what we'll be moving out on. But um, I, would, I would be remiss to say we have exceptionally invested and helpful volunteer user groups already. So oh, we're, we're doing that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so in, I got a comment from uh, Annabelle Morgan and I wanted to give her the opportunity to uh, read that for the, uh, to have this. So we're gonna have this on the recording. Annabelle, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, well, you were talking about roads and um, I believe that roads are important also for the access in case of fire. It seems like 
a lot of the fires, they don't have access unless it's helicopter because there's no way to get in to fight the fire. So therefore more forest land gets um, burnt up. And so that doesn't help our environment, nor does it help in any of the um, wildlife or um, our air quality. Um, so I believe it has been seen that well-managed forests, which include harvesting, mitigates diseases, which also in, can have more fire hazards and destroys forests and habitat. And um, so it won't, it, if we don't want to lose our forests, um, pre-commercial thinning, commercial thinning and harvesting to maintain healthy forests and environment for our fish and wildlife is necessary. So whether it be um, including more roads or going in and, and actually managing the forests, um, I think, you know, saying, oh, we don't want to cut forests is not personally, in my opinion, the best way to make our our forests healthy and accessible for recreation and, um, you know, just for the beauty of our state. Thank you. I agree. Thank you. Um, and again, um, appreciate folks, uh, if um, you know you have a question or a comment to uh, raise your hand and make sure we capture that on the recording. Reason being that the chat is not part of the public record that will ultimately be um, for this meeting. Um, so I uh, wanna give folks, uh, Melissa and Laura Fredrickson's hand up. Did you mean to still have your hand up? Okay, um, well, I can lower that for you, but um, Wanted to just make sure that um, we didn't have more folks on the call with questions or uh, comments. Yes, uh, I see Brett. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, uh, I think mainly for, for uh, well, for everybody who's worked on them, but not having yet read them and needing to dig into them, um, I guess before just to verify, it sounds like in digging into the AOPs, there'll be a mix of um, that's where we'll find the information on how many layered stands would be part of the timber sale, um, the proposed timber sales primary and alternatives. And then also, should we expect to see a mix of, um, I know the funding, <laughs> the funding's not easy, but expect to see a mix of also some recreation oriented projects and restoration oriented projects in there too? Yes. Yeah, so the, uh... The individual sale reports will be where you'll be able to um, pull that out the easiest, uh, which is similar to what's been done in the past. Uh, and that will that will have those those layered stands or, or the, the current structure of, of each of the stands, no matter what the structure is, will be in those sale reports. Uh, inside the sale report, we'll also talk about whether or not there is a uh, stream enhancement opportunity. It's also on the summary document. Uh, there's a, a table all the way at the end, it's table A2, and it's it's a pretty broad table. It'll show, you know, um, which sales have um, different resources within them, and that's that's one easy place to see some of that information. Um, these are all by district, by the way. And uh, as far as the recreational opportunities, the, the best location to look for that is inside the summary document itself, and it breaks it down into planned projects um, and then uh, implementation projects. The planning projects are ones that we're looking at that we're trying to, you know, kind of flesh out details on over the next year. They're, they're not going to be constructed or completed during that fiscal year unless specifically noted um, in one of the follow the, the tables at the end, which is A5 through 7. And those are the types of items, for instance, uh, there's some bridge projects where we will be doing some work on them to like get design work done, but we're not planning on actually putting the bridge in during that fiscal year. And that'll be um, delineated in that um, that A A five or six table, uh, and then like I said, it breaks it up in, in that summary document into projects that are being performed around facilities, projects being performed on motorized, and then projects being performed on non motorized trail. And again, that's by district um, where you'll be able to get into that information. Okay, cool. Thanks, Derek, and thanks, Jason, for uh, dropping that map viewer in the chat. That, that tool is really helpful and snazzy, and 
Yeah, thanks, you guys. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I know some of you like to get into the pre-operation reports. If you want to find those, um, you'll find those in the map application. Um, essentially, you'll, I believe, um, you would click on more info and that gets you to that file. Um, would keep in mind that we're still um, in the process of getting all this information uploaded and ready for the Monday co public comment period. So um, some of it may be up early, some of it won't, uh, but it'll be complete for Monday. So just want to do some expectation setting there. Um, and thanks for that question, Brett. Um, others have uh, questions or thoughts and um, Keep in mind, uh, the, we'll be having the comment period starting Monday, which will give you plenty of time to uh, look through these documents in detail and provide us with input. So one more round of folks. I'm not seeing any hands. I, will we be comfortable calling last call, I think, on, at this point? Well, not seeing uh, any more comments, um, Derek, why don't you uh, jump two slides back to the uh, public comment dates? There we go. Um, so the public comment period uh, does start Monday. Um, if you're on our State Forest email list, you'll uh, be getting a note about that. Um, we're also, we have this uh, shortened URL for you to access our State Forest page directly tiny.cc slash Oregon State Forest. Um, also encourage you to make use of the web app or the web map tool um, if you're looking for those pre-operation reports. But do want to, um, before we go, any other questions or comments either from the public or staff or? I think I'll just make one last comment. Just wanna thank everyone for coming today. Um, my name is Colleen Kaiser, I'm the planning manager. So we just look forward to reading all your comments and um, giving those considerations. So really appreciate all you guys, all the work that you guys do to commenting on our process. Thanks. Thanks, Colleen. And um, we will be, uh, this meeting has been recorded and we'll post it on our YouTube page within the next, I'd say couple of business days. So um, if there's anything you wanted to go back and look at more detail on, you have a colleague who couldn't make it today, um, happy to, post this up so you can refer that to them. So um, seeing no other hands, um, just wanna say thanks to everyone for coming. Um, it's great to see this level of participation and look forward to seeing your comments. And with that, uh, we'll, we'll call it a meeting. Thanks so much, guys.